Welcome everyone to the Rudman Summer Fellows Reception. I wish we could host you in person with food and beverages. Our budget folks, on the other hand, are thrilled by the move to virtual receptions. But I want to take a moment to thank some people, first of all. First, I want to thank Professor John Graby for all of the work he does on a daily basis. His commitment to public service, justice, and leadership comes out in so much of what he does. From bringing in presidential candidates throughout the last year to this year's events with a national audience, including Merrick Garland, leaders from the Congressional Budget Office and the Brookings Institution, the Rudman Center is a constant hub of dialogue and debate. Professor Graby's work in the community is also impressive during these challenging times, and I'm happy that our community benefits from his columns in the local paper and thrilled when I hear him contribute as an expert on public radio. Second, I want to thank the students who were awarded Rudman Fellowships this past summer. There were a whopping 61 of you this year, and I applaud your dedication to public service. Whether you end up in public interest law or at a firm, I hope you will carry that commitment to public service in your heart throughout your entire career. Finally, and importantly, I want to express how grateful we are for our community partners without whom the Rudman Summer Fellows Program simply could not work on the scale that it has now reached. Whether you sponsored a fellow in your office, whether you provided funding, what you have done has had an enormous impact on the lives of our students and in the community at large. In fact, Summer Fellows this year contributed over 20,000 hours of pro bono legal services, mostly in New Hampshire, which is worth nearly 1.3 million in pro bono legal services to the community. Thank you all for the impact you've had on this valuable program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Megan, um, who was unable, um, so sends her regrets that she was unable to join us uh, uh, live today. Um, and just to reiterate what, what, um, what Megan just said, thanks to all of you. Uh, we know that there are students uh, on this uh, Zoom session. There are uh, persons who hosted Summer Fellows. There are persons who donated to the program. There are faculty um, who support our students uh, and help our students find these placements. Thanks to all of you. It really is te a team um, that has come together uh, to, to, you know, to bring about the success of the Rudman Summer Fellows Program. Um, I want to start um, by, uh, I, we have so many generous donors, and I, I hate to, uh, to single any <laughs> donors out, but we have some major sponsors that I, I, I simply need to recognize. Um, Jim Carroll um, and the Allison Curlop Fund, um, the McLean Middleton Law Firm, uh, the New Hampshire Bar Foundation's Justice Grant, funded by uh, the Honorable William F. Batchelder. Uh, the Peter G. Peterson Foundation and the law firm of She and Finney uh, through its William S. Green Memorial Fund. Uh, all of you served as major sponsors for the 2020 Rudman Summer Fellows Program. Uh, and I know that some of you are planning to do the same uh, for the upcoming 2021 Summer Fellows Program. Uh, so deep thanks to you um, and, and deep thanks uh, to everybody uh, who has come together in support of our program. Um, Megan stole my thunder just a little bit. Um, I will share that um, in 2019, um, we raised sufficient money to be able to fund uh, 24 students uh, for summer fellowships. And summer fellowships, by the way, are $4,000. They're designed uh, to enable students uh, to pay their living costs over the course of the summer uh, without having to take another job so that they can uh, take a position with a 501c3 nonprofit or take a position in a government office where they will get excellent training um, but cannot be paid. Um, and um, so in 2019, we were very pleased. Um, there, were, uh, there were 52 applications and we were able to award 24 fellowships. Everything transformed for us last year when the university made available federal work study funds uh, to supplement efforts in this program. Um, and as Megan shared, uh, we, we jumped from 24 summer fellows uh, in the summer of 2019 to 61 summer fellows in the summer of 2020. 
Um, and that included everybody who filled out a FAFSA, uh, regardless of whether they actually qualified for financial aid. A FAFSA, by the way, is the federal form that one fills out when one seeks federal financial aid. Um, uh, and so we were able to, um, uh, to make awards to all students who qualified for federal work study funds. That's what the FAFSA is a conduit to. Uh, and even to some students uh, who were ineligible uh, for federal work study funds. Um, as Megan mentioned, uh, this contributed more than 21,000 hours of pro bono legal work um, to the community. Most of this work took place in New Hampshire, not all of it, but a great deal of it took place in New Hampshire. Um, using the mean hourly wage of lawyers in New Hampshire as of May 2019, this is nearly $1.3 million worth of pro bono legal services to nonprofits and government agencies located, again, largely in New Hampshire. And what I like to say is that, um, you know, you're, there are many calls for support, you know, from, from wonderful organizations that are seeking to address the, the gap in access to justice. Um, what I think makes our program unique um, is that you get a double benefit. You actually get the benefit of the pro bono hours, again, more than 21,000 hours of work that otherwise would not have been done in the community last year. Um, but you are also, or this program also inculcates in our students um, the, the need for pro bono um, and the responsibility of lawyers uh, who are entering a profession where community service and civic service is expected. Uh, in the form of pro bono legal work, in the form of board service, in the in the form of local leadership, any different, any number of ways. And so, you know, I, what I always like to say about the Rudman Center um, is that we support students interested in public interesting lawyering and public service, and we we don't think of that as just a subset of our students. We hope that all of our graduates uh, take this lesson to heart and go on to serve their communities. As you get a sense, just from reading through that, this is a this is a program that has had a huge community impact. Um, we were scheduled to have four student speakers today, but um, I just heard from one of our students who is in a placement right now that she needs to go to trial today. So um, she sends along Victoria Sachs sends along her regrets. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to hand uh, things off uh, to our three student speakers. Um, uh, Amber Ezel, um, Tess Farley, and John Sheehy. Um, and they will be um, uh, talking to you, I believe, in that order. So Amber, please take it away. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Amber Nicole Ezel, and I'm a 3L here at the law school. Um, this summer, uh, I clerked at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's Washington Field Office. Um, and although I didn't know exactly what type of law I wanted to practice um, coming into law school, I knew um, even from the time um, that I was thinking of even going to law school um, that I was going to go into public interest law. Um, the Rudman Summer Fellowship has actually meant a lot for my law school experience um, as I received funding um, to work in public interest summer placements during both my 1L and 2L summers. And both summers I interned in Washington, DC, um, which is notoriously expensive, but also rich um, with opportunities for students wishing to pursue a public interest career. The Rudman Summer Fellowship Program um, funding enabled me to um, have the unique opportunity to work at nonprofits and federal agencies that don't offer funding for law students, um, which is especially critical for students from marginalized backgrounds um, who don't have the privilege of forgoing pay while working full time for an entire summer. Um, and truly your generosity to the Rudman Summer Fellowship Program allowed me to pay for my living expenses so that I could work without a salary um, at the EEOC this summer, which was especially helpful um, given the times that we're, we're living in, in in a global pandemic. Um, serving as a law clerk at the EEOC was a wonderful uh, once in a lifetime experience. Um, and it was actually one of the highlights of my law school career. Um, and since the EEOC doesn't take law clerks after graduation, I knew um, when I was offered the opportunity that I could not pass it up. Um, during my summer fellowship, I had the opportunity to clerk for a supervisory administrative judge um, and in this role, I helped draft orders and decisions, um, reviewed investigative files, 
and observed administrative hearings and mediations between agencies and employees across the federal government. Um, my clerkship solidified my interest in pursuing employment law when I graduate, graduate this upcoming May. Um, and it was truly an honor and a pleasure to work alongside an administrative judge in the federal government and to learn firsthand um, the ins and outs of employment litigation. I um, mean, this clerkship was particularly um, beneficial for me just because I um, got the opportunity to really put into practice the things that I'm learning in the classroom um, and being able to have the unique position of assessing legal facts and issues in a neutral manner, which I know um, will be particularly beneficial um, no matter what side of litigation I'm on. Um, and the highlight of my summer was watching parties reach agreements about some of the most contentious employment disputes, um, especially when settlements seem nearly impossible. Um, I will never forget this experience, and I'm certain that it will have um, a profound impact on my legal career. Um, so your support uh, of the Rudman Summer Fellows Program made my work with the EEOC possible, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, so thank you so much again for your generous donations um, and your continued support of the Rudman Center and the Summer Fellows Program. Um, so now um, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Tess Farley, um, who's going to share her summer experiences as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, like Amber, I am, my name is Tess Farley, and I'm also a 3L um, at UNH Law. This past summer, I was lucky enough to intern with the National Advocates for Pregnant Women, also known as NAPW. Uh, NAPW is a reproductive justice organization that fights for all pregnant people who are punished for negative pregnancy outcomes. Uh, they also work to ensure that pregnant people in prison are given adequate prenatal health care and are allowed the dignity of giving birth unshackled. And as a lifelong reproductive rights advocate, this internship really was a dream come true. Um, it was a combination of criminal defense, family law, health law, civil rights, and I am so grateful for all the donors who made that opportunity possible. Um, for those of you who are only familiar with reproductive justice in the context of abortion, um, reproductive justice is defined as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, and to parent to the children that we have in safe and sustainable communities. So as an intern with a reproductive justice organization, I was able to assist on a criminal defense case of a woman who had been arrested for having a stillbirth. The woman struggled with addiction and had used illegal substances while she was pregnant. And the prosecutors in her state then applied the murder statute to her for having that stillbirth. And again, as a brief explainer, the medical and scientific communities don't have concrete evidence that substance use during pregnancy will cause stillbirths. We know that pregnancy outcomes run the gamut um, and we're still not sure exactly what causes miscarriages or stillbirths, but by prosecuting women for their pregnancy outcomes, we open the door for women to be prosecuted for any negative outcome if the state disagrees with their behavior while pregnant. And while this case was our primary focus for the summer, we became aware of another case where a woman had been arrested and convicted for almost the exact same thing, for having a stillbirth and for using illegal substances while she was pregnant and was charged with murder. Because NAPW is a relatively small organization and one of the only organizations in the country that focuses on this issue, they didn't have the capacity to take on the second case themselves. While they were working on organizing a team of pro bono attorneys uh, for this second case, I was given the opportunity to write a series of memos on possible creative strategies to ensure her release. I researched and wrote about possible legal strategies, temporary remedies, and avenues for non-legal advocacy. This was a great experience to learn all the things a lawyer can do both in and out of the court and to get experience on organizing for a client outside of the courtroom. It also taught me that the combination of advocacy efforts is most likely to be successful when working for a client. I did all this in preparation for if we ever found a team to take over for her representation. And it really was an honor and 
a great motivator to fight for someone who had been forgotten by her old attorneys and by other organizations. She was eventually assigned a really great team of attorneys who were all given my memos as a foundations for their case theories if needed. NAPW is in New York City. Um, and while I ended up working remotely due to COVID, I really wouldn't have been able to even accept this position without a Redmond Fellowship. Knowing I would have a summer stipend allowed me to take this leap and accept my dream internship basically, which was unpaid in a very expensive city. Um, so I wanna thank all the donors who made that possible. It really uh, means a lot to us students. And now I will pass it on to John Sheehy to talk about his summer experience. Thank you, Tess. Uh, so my name is John Sheehy, and uh, I was a 1L last summer. Um, and last summer, I worked two internships. I had one at the Superior Court in Cheshire County, and I had another halftime internship with CASA of New Hampshire. And what that meant for me as a relatively new student to the law was that I spent half of my summer viewing the law from the sort of Olympian height of the judge. And I spent the other half of the week viewing the law from the street level view of CASA of New Hampshire. Um, if you don't know about CASA, what, what CASA means, CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. And what CASAs are, are a trained group of volunteers that are statutorily mandated in New Hampshire to act as guardians ad litem for children at pretty much any point when the state intervenes in those children's lives. And CASA of New Hampshire is the organization that supports and trains and represents those people in court as they frequently need. Um, my work for CASA, unlike my work for the Superior Court, uh, was focused largely on a fairly narrow spectrum of uh, New Hampshire law. Really, they, they spend almost all of their time thinking about two or three uh, statutes, the child protection statute, the statute having to do with the termination of parental rights. Um, the attorneys that I work for, who I can't see, but I know you're out there, Betsy and Caroline, um, know those statutes inside and out and spend all day every day negotiating those statutes which is an art form in itself and also helping other people to negotiate those statutes so what i did for casa was pretty much what you would expect a 1l intern to be doing in their first summer which was a lot of sort of basic level work i wrote memos i wrote a lot of motions uh, I, I did beginner's work. All of it was terribly interesting and all of it was illuminating. But the, the part that I found most uh, worthwhile actually was the, in many respects, the most sort of mundane aspect of it. It was writing uh, motions. It was just the, the everyday day-to-day -day aspect of writing uh, motions where I, I was forced to think about statutes, think about how to move from a statute to an argument that would move a judge to do something that I wanted them to do, um, how to incorporate case law, how to write quickly, how to write briefly. Both of those are, are not things that I'm naturally good at. Um, and I had a lot of guidance from the lawyers of CASA who were excellent teachers and excellent mentors. Um, but the most important thing that I experienced when I was doing that, as I was writing those memos, every time I was given a project, and by the way, the first thing they teach you at CASA is don't talk about the details of the case because these are, these are vulnerable people. So I'm not gonna share a particular anecdote here, but I will tell you what it was like just to work the case. Um, every time I was given a project, I was given a file. And the, the files were thick and thin, depending on uh, what the case was. But initially, at the beginning of the summer, when I got a file, it just seemed like it was full of pieces of paper. Most of those pieces of paper were pretty nondescript. Some of them were almost indecipherable. They were full of sort of bureaucratic notes that were filled out by various people and state employees. 
And it was only after I'd worked for a while on these files and written these motions for a while that I started to realize that these files were sort of strangely heavy. And the thing that made them heavy was not the paper inside or the ink on the paper, but it was that inside each one of those files, there was a child, there was a kid. And, and if there was a kid inside there, there was also a mother inside there. And if there was a mother, there was a father, and sometimes there were more than one father, and there were also grandparents, and there were siblings, and the siblings might be all over the place, and there were representatives of the state, and there was the Spalding Home for Youth, and there was, that file was full of people. And at the center of the file was always a family. There was a kid and their immediate family, and one day, for whatever reason, you know, addiction or poverty or just chaos, this family had just kind of fallen into a hole in the world. And as they fell, they pulled all those people down with them. And they, you could feel as you read the files, the pull that was inside the file. And you realized eventually, if you did it long enough, that one of the things, one of the people being pulled by the file was you, was me that I, I was being pulled to, to do something with respect to that file because I was implicated in the file. I was connected to the people in that file. I was connected to that kid, even though I'd never met him or even seen him because, because they were part of my community. And that's what it meant to be part of a community. That's what it meant to be a citizen of a state or a city or a county. It's what it, it was what it meant to be connected to other people. And so when I started my work at CASA and when I started my internship last summer, I, I had the same idea that probably a lot of people out there listening to me have, a sort of abstract idea that I'm interested in public interest. And I had an, I had an abstract thought about public interest. And by the time I was done at CASA, I had a much more specific idea of what public interest meant. And what it meant was that we are all, whether we like it or not, all connected to each other, that we are all connected to our neighbors and the other people in our community. And we have some responsibility to do something with whatever skills we have, whatever knowledge we have, whatever tools we have available to us, whatever privilege we have, to mobilize, to do something, to make the lives of the people around us marginally better. And what I told the people at CASA at the end, uh, I mean, it, I, I can't see you here and I, I sort of apologize for that, but I know you're out there and I know uh, the, the lawyers at CASA, Betsy and Caroline, who are out in the crowd somewhere, they get up every day. They're wonderful, intelligent, smart, hardworking people um, who probably just walk down the street and, and are as unnoticed as anybody else. But what they do every day is get up and pony it up to go to work and sit down every week for eight hours and just protect the weak from the strong and protect the vulnerable from the things that they're vulnerable to. And and that is a remarkable thing to do. And that is to me what it means to be involved in public interest. So for those of you out there who are one else now and are considering what to do, like this is, this is a valuable and worthwhile thing to do. Do public interest, connect with CASA if you can. And I would very much like to thank the, the people at CASA and the, and the Superior Court for giving me this chance. And I would very much like to thank the sponsors of this program for the equally important uh, thing of getting me paid for it. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a valuable experience and I'm glad that I've had it. So thank you. And with that, I will pass you back, I believe, to Professor Grady. That's right. Um, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amber. Thank you, Tess. Thank you, John. Uh, honestly, anything I would say uh, would, would be superfluous at this point. Um, that was wonderful. Um, 
Uh, so I guess I'll just reiterate to the entire community that is out there, thank you so much uh, for all that you do um, and for uh, supporting this, uh, this, this wonderful and impactful uh, program. Um, next year, uh, we will be uh, back together uh, in person. Um, we, will, we will take our savings from this year and put it towards more expensive wine and better beer and, and higher uh, higher quality snacks. Uh, I you have my promise on that. Um, so I hope to see you all soon and thanks very much.